Good evening, everyone. I am Renita Marshall, Vice Chancellor for Academics and Student Support Services and Associate Dean for the College of Agriculture, Family and Consumer Sciences. I will be serving as your facilitator for this evening. We would like to welcome you to the Southern University Agriculture Research and Extension Center's webinar entitled, Agriculture Solutions for Diversity, Access and Equality. The purpose of this webinar is to bring about discussions related to issues facing today's society of HBCUs, farmers, scientists, and our communities. You will hear how our panelists use their Southern University agriculture education and training to come up with solutions to challenges of accessing the needs to our function and bring about change. Again, on behalf of our Chancellor Dean, Dr. Orlando F. McMeans, we welcome you to this evening's webinar. Our Chancellor will provide closing comments at the end. Our panelists, we have Irene Lewis, who was a Southern University Spring 2020 Chief Student Marshal, the student graduating with the highest grade point average over 3.9 in the class of 2020. Lewis earned a bachelor's degree in agriculture sciences with a concentration in plant and soil science. During her academic career at Southern University, Irene was elected the National Undergraduate President of the Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences Organization for the 2019-2020 year and Region 4 National Undergraduate Vice President of Manners for the 2018 through 2019 year. Irene represented the organization's college chapters in Louisiana, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and Texas. Irene was also active in the local Southern University chapter of Manners, where she served as both the secretary and historian. He, she has entered with the congressional, she has interned with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and is currently working on a master's of public administration at the Ohio State University focusing on food access policy. Dr. DQ Fields is the Dean and Senior Associate Vice President for the Bumpers College of Agricultural, Food, and Life Sciences and Division of Agriculture at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Prior to his current appointment, Dr. Fields was a faculty member at Auburn University and served as professor and chair of the Department of Agriculture Economics and Rural Sociology. In his administrative role, he has been successful in establishing multidisciplinary collaborations to attract extramural funds, build relationships with alumni and industry stakeholders to enhance the student experience. He has also conducted research on the impact of agribusinesses on state, regional, and national economies and assisted agribusinesses with marketing and management strategies. Dr. Fields earned a bachelor's degree from Southern University, a master's degree from the University of Missouri Columbia, and a PhD from Louisiana State University, all in agricultural economics. Ms. Beatra Wilson is the Assistant Director of Corporate and Forestry and National Lead for Urban, Urban and Community Forestry at the USDA Forest Service in Washington, DC. In this position, Wilson oversees program policy, budget, partnership development, and strategic delivery of national regional and state urban and community forestry programs. She has served on the Forest Service Environmental Justice Board, co-chaired the USDA 1890 Land Grant Task Force Executive Committee, and has built a solid career administering conservation cooperative assistance programs in regional and national offices. She currently serves as agency representative to the Secretary of Agriculture's Office of Customer Experience, and has completed White House detailed assignments to the Council on Environmental Quality and Office of Management and Budget. Wilson earned a bachelor's degree in urban forestry from Southern University and a master's degree in public administration from Kennesaw State University. Dr. Renee Brown is the pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He also serves as the president and moderator of the 4th District Missionary Baptist Association of Louisiana and Secretary of the T.J. Jemison Baptist Student Union Board. He is also a member of the board of Leland College, 
Habitat for Humanity of Greater Baton Rouge, and the Workforce Investment Act Youth Services. Pastor Brown received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Plant and Soil Science from Southern University and a Master's degree in Crop Physiology from Louisiana State University. Upon graduation, he accepted a position with EI DuPont Company as a marketing representative. While working for DuPont, he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in Theology from Western Baptist Bible College and completed his Master's of Divinity degree in Biblical Interpretation from Central Baptist Theological Seminary. Pastor Brown resigned from DuPont in 2001 to be a full-time pastor. Shortly after that, Dr. Brown received his Doctor of Ministry degree in Church Administration from Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. During the webinar, you will have the opportunity to submit questions in the chat box as well as under the Q&A tab. Questions will be addressed during our question and answer period. Our moderators for this evening's webinar are Ms. Lakeisha Giddens-Lust, Communications Coordinator for the Southern University Ag Center, and Dr. Harold Lillian, Chair of the Department of Agriculture Sciences within the College of Agriculture, Family, and Consumer Sciences. We will, we will now begin our webinar. Ms. Lust. You're on mute, Ms. Lusk. You're still on mute. You're still on mute. Good evening, everyone. This first question goes to Dr. Fields. Isolation is often a serious concern of students leaving HBCUs to attend PWIs. Please share your thoughts on pursuing graduate school with your own cheering squad. And also, what intentional recruitment tools can PWIs use to assist in retention? First, I just want to say thank you to uh, Chancellor McMeans and my Southern University family for inviting me to participate in this very timely webinar certainly a privilege to participate. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump right into isolation. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, it is a big issue, a big problem. Uh, I'll say if, if you want to fall victim to the predator that I will call college failure, let yourself get isolated. Uh, the main goal of a predator is to separate his prey from the pack because they know that they are weaker and more vulnerable alone. And I think that all of us can say that we would not be successful if we tried to do graduate school alone. So, um, you know, I say that, you know, students, if you're wise, immediately start to build uh, that pack or that cheering squad, as it's been termed, because uh, this will help protect you from failure. You know, it, it is a definite culture shock to leave the comforts of Southern University or, or, the, or an HBCU and go to a large PWI. You know, when I first arrived at University of Missouri, um, it was definitely uncomfortable. One of the most important things uh, to learn while an undergraduate, though, is how to network. Um, you start building that network, that professional network, and that cheering squad the day you reach the campus. Um, you can't be afraid to meet people, to ask questions. Uh, there are individuals at Southern University currently, like Dr. Calvin Walker or Patricia Miense, who I would say are still part of my, my cheering squad. Uh, so there are also universities, government agencies, private institutions around the country who uh, have individuals who are willing to serve as mentors for students to help them, you know, deal with that issue of isolation. Um, but also students, do your research on the university that you're interested in. Learn about the culture, you know, find out about their managed chapter, their Black Graduate and Professional Student Organization. They, they'll have an Office of Diversity and Inclusion, a Multicultural Center. Contact them early. Get to know what happened, what's happening there. Start developing those relationships immediately. Um, there may not be a lot of students in your individual department, but I'm sure that there are individuals on campus that, that you can relate to. And also, don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone and, and meet people who are not like you. I think that that is one of the most important things about you know getting out into that different environment, uh, learning what um, is out there other than you and learning more about um, other cultures. 
And in terms of uh, intentional recruitment, I think that it's, it's critical that um, PWIs uh, do reach out and, and, and try to be intentional about uh, recruiting students. Uh, I'll say uh, I've been here almost two years and I have my first Southern University master's student who just started an ag business here at, at University of Arkansas. So really excited to do that. And that's from some intentional recruitment. Um, but you know, when, when, when we reach out and we have programs that are designed around those students, it, the students should know that we really want them here, that we are, that it is our goal to make sure that they're in the right environment, that they're valued, the structure should be there, the climate should be there, the people should be there to foster success for that student. Uh, and so, you know, I think that you know, all institutions who are doing that are showing that they are, are putting some value and putting some, some money where their mouth is in terms of embracing students. A lot of times it's, it's, it's uh, you want students there and it's not intentional that the, it, that the culture is not there. But when you see that they are putting the resources into it, you know that they're doing what's necessary to make sure that they can uh, have that diverse climate uh, at the university. Thank you for that, Dr. Fields. <clears throat> Dr. Brown, what role should Southern or even Southern University Ag play in addressing some of the social and racial issues that are so pervasive across the country? Well, let me first of all thank um, this committee and uh, Dr. Means for this opportunity also to share with you. Uh, agriculture is my passion. I, I, if you stick me, I bleed agriculture. Uh, it's what I've always wanted to do. And because of that, I think it's a good way to segue into what you just asked. Uh, when we think about Southern University, and especially when I came through in the 80s, uh, we had a group of people there that made sure that the students were well-rounded and they were ready for what they were getting into. And so I think that Southern University should play a, a very pivotal role. It's, it's inevitable that Southern University be active in making sure that our students understand what, what's, at, what's at stake. Because when you leave that institution, you represent that institution. And those students need to recognize that you, you're not just going as a person of color, you're actually going as a representative of that institution. And so I, I feel strongly that you have to separate Southern University from the ag system. And, and by that, I mean this, Southern University has one charge, but I think the ag department has another charge because in many instances, those who go into agriculture, you'll find yourself in a smaller number oftentimes than you would in, in a bigger setting. And so as, uh, as Dr. Fields mentioned earlier, you may be the only one. Being black may have gotten you in that door but you gotta be careful that being black doesn't get you exited out of that very same door because they'll put the resources there to get you there and then they'll turn around and use that to say, well, see, we tried, we hired some of them and then they couldn't do it. And one of the things I remember when I was coming through and they were recruiting, they would often say, we can't find blacks in agriculture. Well, that's a lie. You can find them, you just don't know where to go to get them. And then when you get them, you don't even give them a fair chance to be successful because you stack, the deck is stacked against them because oftentimes they are alone. They don't understand the culture. They don't understand the system. And then they get into the culture and the system. And then you're trying to tell them how you want them to function. And they can't necessarily function the way you want them to function. So I think Southern University has to take a strong position in making sure that our students are educated in a way that they know what they're getting into, especially when we talk about racism, because that system has been here for over 400 years. It's not gonna go anywhere. And if you use that as a crutch, it's not gonna help you get anywhere. So Southern University has to be out front, but I think when you look at it from the system perspective, that's one thing you gotta think about educationally. But then when you start thinking about the college, you got to look at that from another perspective, because most of the time in the agriculture setting, the African-American is in an environment where they are the only one. And if I would not have had the, the right teachers, 
telling me, listen, you're going to go and this is how this is going to be. And you need to be mindful because sometimes they'll say they want you, but they don't want you. And let me just give you a, a short example to prove that. I was highly recruited by LSU. Dr. Bobby Fields was instrumental in that. But at the same time, going to LSU was not a place. They, they didn't want me there coming from Southern University. There's something about Southern University and LSU. It's a, it's a natural, uh, I call it a natural hatred. Uh, so when you say LSU, I generally say love Southern University. Because again, it, it's something that's there and they can't stand to have a person from Southern University come there and succeed. And then especially one of color and then one that they're paying more money than they're paying any other grad assistant. So then my problems came from the faculty and staff that didn't want me there. But because I had people back at Southern University that I could go back to and talk to and they helped me navigate the system. That's what the ag department, ag school has to be able to do. Don't just send those students out, but educate those students about where they're going and help them to understand where they're going. They're not representing themselves. They're representing Southern, the Southern University. Thank you for that, Dr. Brown. Um, that actually kind of segues into our next question, which is for Ms. Wilson. Please describe a racial or inequity issue you faced and explain how you address that issue. Thank you, Ms. Lusk. Let me uh, join my, my panel members in thanking Chancellor Brown and, and uh, my Southern University family as well for this invitation to join you for this conversation tonight. Um, the question you ask is very good, and, 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 and a lot of it was covered by Dr. Brown, to be honest with you. But I will tell you personally, I am a, a Black woman in forestry. Urban forestry is my field. Uh, but uh, I, one of the, in, when you ask the question around uh, racial inequity, um, I think just my, the profession in general, you know, my agency at U.S. Forest Service, Black females, black women are less than 5% of the workforce. And so on any given day, it, it, and I have 19 years of career experience, uh, there is always a shock factor when I walk into the room. So I, I think I'd like to address it from their opportunities, depending on you know these agricultural fields we go into. It's like Dr. Brown said, many times you'll be the only one. And I've been the only one out in the field which means out in the woods, um, a young black woman with an all male team, sometimes all white male team, and it doesn't matter the setting, you still have to be deeply rooted and maintain your professionalism and know who you are. Uh, it, it doesn't change as much when you go into the boardroom or you're administering a program or, or financial resources because oftentimes there may be one or two more in that setting but they're still, you're still not the majority in the room. And so whether it comes from the, the field and the technical side, I've spent time in with the Forest Service. Uh, I've been, I'm in urban and community forestry. I've been in wildfire. I think the, what's important with regard to these inequities is that I maintain my professionalism and know who I am. Um, I will also say that for young people who may be watching, the earliest glimpse into what you may expect is the conferences and the meetings where you may have that opportunity uh, and, and partners like myself at USDA always want young people to get exposed at these agricultural and natural resources and uh, conservation settings, mainly so they can get a glimpse into the reality. What attracted me to agriculture was the diversity of the staff at Southern University. Uh, re what retained me there with regard to education was that nurturing by all these people who look like me and act like me and understood my background. But when I entered the Forest Service five days after graduating from Southern University, it was a game changer, but I was prepared to be the only one or one of the few. So I will tell you that um, that's a reality and I echo a lot of what Dr. Brown has said because um, it's the truth, and here I am 19 years later, and there's not been uh, a significant shift in the demographics of the room. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. 
Now, as we move on to Ms. Lewis, what characteristics, traits, contributions, and behaviors are most valued and rewarded within your chosen field of agriculture? Um, thank you for that question, Dr. Melian. And I'd also like to echo the other panelists in saying thank you to some of my former professors and Southern University family um, for inviting us to this panel. So um, in regards to behaviors and traits and characteristics that I feel like have made me most successful, um, even though I'm still a student, just within my professional experience, I think I can point to three specific things. Um, and those things are teachability, resilience, and confidence. So with that first aspect, I think um, a lot of the other panelists have touched on it and saying that Southern University is gonna prepare you wherever um, you're gonna go in your career, but you still have to be teachable. I went from being in an agriculture, agricultural science-based major to going into policy and public affairs. And so even with that shift, even though like some of my experiences in classes I overlapped from undergrad, there's still a lot that I have to learn. And I think without that, that spirit of just being teachable and always willing to learn, um, you'll never grow from that. And with that comes resilience. So um, you're gonna face issues like everyone else has spoken of that you are the only one in the room and you do have, you do have feel like you have to speak up for everyone who looks like you or everyone who comes from where you come from. Um, but having that sense of strength and resilience to know that one, your voice matters and two, you have something to offer into a room. It's gonna take you far no matter what career path or educational path you choose to go on. And the last thing I think um, I would speak on is confidence. And so one of the things that I always do when I introduce myself to my classmates, to teachers, to people at different organizations is I always say, my name is Irene Lewis and I'm a graduate of the illustrious Southern University in A&M College. And I think that right there sets you apart from other people in your classroom who don't come in with that same sense of confidence, who don't, who don't come in with that same, same sense of pride about who they are and where they come from. And when you start off that first impression really strong and really confidently, um, people are attracted to that and people are attracted to you and you attract people who are willing to help you um, as you move down the line because you never know who in that room also went to an HBCU or who in that room also went to Southern University. Um, I've been in grocery stores and at conferences and in all these random places where I've met professionals who were HBCU graduates or Southern graduates or Southern Ag graduates um, and those have been the people who have been willing to help me and nurture me um, and advocate for me as I move from being a student to being a professional. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. This next question is coming from our chat box and I will direct it to Dr. Fields. Has anyone ever made an assumption about you based on your race or physical attributes? Certainly. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, that's an interesting question. So I, I will kind of give a, um, an experience I had coming into the interview process at, at Auburn University. So I um, left uh, LSU and uh, went for my interview. And as soon as I got off the elevator, um, someone, the, the guy who met me asked, um, he said, well, man, you look more like a football player than an ag economist. And so my uh, response to him was, so what does an ag economist look like? And, you know, and so it, it kind of started this trend where I, I met with like four or five people. And before I did my seminar, about four or five people indicated, you look more like a football player than an ag economist. Or, or man, you like you're here to play football, something like something to that, uh, of that nature. So really, I, I will say, though, that, you know, by the time I got an opportunity to give my presentation, I, I was kind of bothered by it. So I got up and I, I called all of them out individually. I said, Dr. So-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so said, you know, seem to think I'm here for the football team, but I want to make sure everyone knows I'm here to be an ag economist. But what happened from that is the person who met me at the elevator really, um, was kind of taken aback by the comment and he came back to me. And he said, look, I apologize for that. He said, I didn't realize how offensive that sounded until you brought it up in the seminar. And so it was one of those teachable moments. Um, and this person actually became probably my biggest, I will say my biggest mentor at Auburn University uh, because it was really ignorance. It was cultural ignorance that he was dealing with. So he, he said, if, if someone told him he looked like a football player, he would have been flattered. 
but so often uh, people reduce you to what they think you can be and don't give you the credit for who you really are. And so it, it's even, uh, you know, being um, dean at a PWI, um, first thing, in, 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 it's, it's no big deal, but first thing someone says, you say, I'm University of Arkansas, if you're at a big meeting, they'll say Pine Bluff. And then if I say Fayetteville, then they have this look of shock on their face. And, you know, uh, given there are only two uh, black in the country, I can, you know, can understand why. But, you know, they, they want to have this discussion then. And then you have to give the resume rundown of where you went, how you got there, why you qualified. To the point, a lot of times I hate to tell people that I'm the dean at University of Arkansas Fayetteville because I know I got to explain why and how I got there. But, yeah, so that, that happens uh, uh, pretty frequently. Thank you. And let's go back to Dr. Brown. Do you think it's ethical to change people because you think their characteristics are different or somehow less superior to yours? If so, what situation do you feel this is justified? Well, first of all, we have to ask the question, who says it's unethical? Because oftentimes what a person of color may find to be unethical white people don't find it unethical. And many times my experience has been that most people operate from what I call situational ethics. So depending on the situation, you will see certain ethical type behavior. Uh, but then the other thing is what is ethical? What does that really mean? And that, that suggests being consistent with some agreed principles about correct moral conduct. And a lot of times, some of the activity that we, we see, it may not be illegal, but it certainly isn't ethical. Slavery wasn't ethical. Putting your neck on a handcuffed black man for eight minutes and 46 seconds or seven minutes and 46 seconds now that they are debating that issue, that's not ethical either. But dead is dead. And so when you start looking at who's defining what's ethical and what's not ethical, you could talk all day and you could go on and on and on. Uh, but it's never ethical to look at a person and judge the person based on what you see and then make a determination about them just because you think that they ought to be this particular way or they ought to fit this particular stereotype. And, and that's, that's never good. Um, so when you, when you start looking at it and thinking about it, I always try to come, to the vantage, come from the vantage point of who's a, actually asking that question. And um, I'd also add to and, and say this, I remember going into Delaware and I thought racism really was down south. But I went to Delaware and my first day on the job, going in the bank to open up a bank account, a brother in a suit, and they said that I robbed the bank. They made a determination just because I was black and I showed up at the bank. Same thing when I went to DuPont the same day, the first day on the job, I went to go in the building and they wouldn't even let me in the building because they didn't think I was supposed to be in the building. That's never ethical. That's never ethical, but people will do it and they'll hide behind whatever reason. But the reality of it is, it's never right. It's never ethical. I don't care who's done it before. That doesn't make it right. And we should be cognizant of that when we make those kind of judgment calls. Thank you, Dr. Brown. We're going to ask another question from the chat box. And this question is going to um, any of our panelists. Um, is there a network or system to join, uh, well, a network or system for Black Ag students or alumni to join who are currently at PWIs um, and also at HBCUs? I can um, answer that really quickly. So um, the first thing that popped in my mind was manners. So Manners is a professional organization that focuses on um, di diversifying and creating inclusive environments for minorities in agriculture, natural resources, and related sciences. 
Um, and so as a graduate student, I was like um, Dr. Marshall mentioned earlier, I was extremely active in manners in undergrad, both nationally and at Southern University. And that is where I met most of my mentors, I think, as I was in college. And then as I'm transitioning um, as into graduate school and as a professional, um, it's still a network that I tap into. So you can um, look up more about manners at www.manrrs.org to kind of get um, connected with chapters that are in your local area or just reach out to people who um, can answer more of your questions. But it's a great opportunity, I think. Um, a lot of the panelists who are here, Dr. McNeese was a, was a former president of Manners Nationally. And so um, I think it's a great organization to not only connect with black students, but other students of color and other minority groups, because at the end of the day, we, we all share very similar experiences being in, being in agriculture. Um, I remember being at one conference and there was only a handful of black students there, but we all kind of connected and our connection point was that um, we were super involved in manners at our local chapter. So I would definitely look into that a little bit more if you're looking for more networks in that area. Would any other of our panelists like to tag along on Ms. Lewis's comments? Uh, Dr. Melian, I can add to that because I was a member of Manners and still a fond supporter of Manners in my professional career. Um, but also, uh, if you're not in school per se and you're curious, as you transition into your profession, I also encourage you to um, obtain those memberships uh, that are within your profession. There are societies and trade associations uh, that will allow you to get a little bit, broaden your network with regard to people in your industry, but not just people. What we're seeing now, well, what I'm seeing now in 2020 is a lot more of those organizations beginning to carve out spaces for those uh, diverse uh, members of their organizations to make sure that there is a safe space. So just because on the surface the organization may not have minority or diversity or black or uh, cultural in the title, uh, do a little bit more homework because what I'm seeing, especially in this year, is many of our agricultural organizations, trade associations and societies um, being intentional about creating those spaces uh, for, the, for the diversity uh, to be more inclusive and to resolve some of these issues around belonging. Thank you. And let's go back to the chat for a quick moment. And I will ask this to uh, the panelists, anyone can answer. What role do you believe Southern University should play in admitting and accommodating indigenous black and brown individuals with disabilities? I can kind of touch on that a little bit. Um, so I think the first thing is um, one of the things that I talk to, especially Black students about, is understanding that even though we're considered minorities ourselves, it's important that we address our own specific privileges. So even though I experience discrimination as a Black woman, I'm also an able-bodied person, and physically all environments are pretty much accommodating to me as an able-bodied individual. So I think that's the first thing is kind of addressing some of those um, privileges. Um, I think the other thing, and we talk about this when we talk about companies diversifying their staff, um, but a lot of times we just think about it in terms of like race and ethnicity. So as long as we have a racially diverse staff, then we're doing great when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But there are a lot of, there are tons of definitions for diversity and there's tons of definitions for minorities. Um, and I think we have to continue to have conversations about what identities are left out of the room. And so just like you mentioned, Indigenous voices are, are oftentimes left out of the room. Um, the voices of disabled individuals are oftentimes left out of the room. Being a veteran is, a, is an identity that affects people both mentally and their family settings economically and socially. Um, and sometimes those voices aren't heard. And so we don't have those voices heard. Decisions that are made can't be made in an a equitable and inclusive way. So I think um, even within minoritized institutions, we still have to do the work of understanding our privilege and understanding our identities and asking, okay, who isn't at this table and who needs to be at this table so that we can create a more exclusive environment for everyone. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Wilson. Um, so we're gonna go back to you, Ms. Wilson, uh, with another question. Um, what characteristics, traits, contributions, oh, excuse me, what characteristics, traits, contributions, and behaviors are most valued and rewarded with your chosen field of agriculture? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, contributions and traits, I, I would say my profession is urban and community forestry. And so I had the opportunity to uh, deliver conservation where 83, 84% of Americans live, which is in metropolitan areas. And if we wanna dig a little deeper, uh, that's where our most vulnerable communities are. And a significant amount of the minorities uh, with populations in America. And so I think some of my uh, attributes and, and traits that I can bring into this space absolutely uh, are, are from one, my lived experience as a woman of color and, and being able to provide, like Ms. Ms. Lewis just said, a voice to, to those who may not, may feel like they are voiceless. Um, we, are, we are currently in the midst of a global pandemic that uh, is a respiratory virus and in many of our inner cities, for example, uh, air quality is a challenge. And so when we think about um, the vulnerability, it's amplified when I think about these communities and the health risk and the health disparities uh, that these populations have already had to deal with coming into such a, a, a global a, a virus that is um, definitely uh, the mortality rate is higher for us as people of color and um, people with lower incomes, for example. So I would say that I'm able to um, activate some of that and bring that to the table and gain some trust in these spaces that I deal with. And again, this is urban and community forestry and spending a lot of time in the inner city, um, but also it stretches to the environment, environmental justice, uh, and then on what we see now a lot of with regard to urban agriculture, trying to be the solution to many of the food deserts that we're dealing with in the inner city, the loss of grocery stores and the economic distress. So, uh, you know, I, I, I like to bring my whole self to uh, the space and I, I feel like the platform that I've been blessed to sit on, uh, it's one of those ways that I, I, I can't shy away or back down from those opportunities. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. And we are going to hop in the chat box and I will direct this question to Dr. Fields. Um, it says, I'm a part of the Louisiana FFA state staff and we focus on high school students in agricultural education. What can we do on a state and national level to bring up our black and other people of color students numbers in our courses so they are more likely to pursue an education and career in agriculture? Okay, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that um, a, a lot of times there's just this overall stigma with, with the word agriculture when uh, students uh, hear it, when they're, you know, younger, high school age. Um, the first thing they think of is hard work and being out on the farm in the sun. And I think that, and sometimes I think the issue is the messaging that we actually have. So. I think that it's important that our, our ag teachers who are typically our first touch with those students to expose them to agriculture, that they are equipped with the material necessary to educate students about the plethora of careers that, um, that are available or the career options that, that students have. You know, I, I always say that, you know, I look at our college and, you know, you, you, we had, um, uh, several students who've gone on to medical school from animal sciences or from food science or plant science. Um, we have students who are remaining in agriculture, but uh, things like a food epidemiologist. So students don't understand the science that, you know, is involved in agriculture and that, you know, they can be a scientist and still be involved in the food industry or understand the, the breadth of companies that are in the, that are fortune 500 companies that, that feed the world. And so I think that if anything, you know, trying to make sure that students know uh, what options there are out there, uh, understanding the career choices that they have, and understanding that it's, you, it, I think it's good for them to understand that they are needed in this area. Uh, because, you know, I think that, you know, I think companies are actually doing better than universities in, in recruiting uh, students of color. 
And so we, you know, I'll say here, we need students of color. Uh, we need diversity. I think our, a diverse community is a healthy community. And uh, the more diverse we get, the healthier our overall organization will be. So uh, just kind of exposing them is, is the thing I would say is most important. If I can piggyback on what uh, Dr. Phil said, um, FFA, when I came through, blacks were not allowed to be a part of FFA. That was in 83, okay? And so in many instances, the, the ag instructors were white. And so many times, as Dr. Phil said, the definition of agriculture is not right in the eyes of many of our black students. But then when you have a, 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 an institution like FFA that does not really open itself or lend itself to people of color and or they don't even deal with some of the atrocities that they have caused in the past, it also will make our students shy away from it. So I think you do need to deal with the history, but I also think you're going to have to deal with the fact that you have to redefine the definition for many of our young blacks and help them to understand that agriculture is a great field of study as Dr. Phil said, that you can go into a lot of different areas and you're going to have a great job when you get out. And in many instances, you may never go into a forest. You may never go into a field. You know, you, you could be in an office in a suit all the time. So I think we just have to retrain our young people to think it's not that thing that we're accustomed to called slavery. It's something more now that has a lot of opportunities and we just don't get those opportunities for different reasons. Thank you, Doctors Field and Brown, uh, for that question, well, for that answer. Now we're going to go to Ms. Irene Lewis. Ms. Lewis, how did your experience at Southern University prepare you professionally? Thank you for that question. So I think I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, and I feel like most HBCU graduates and Southern graduates will say the same thing, but really the community that nurtures you um, and helps you to grow as you're an undergraduate student. I've told people this before, but between those ages of 18 and 22 to 24, 25, however long you're in college, there's a lot of personal growth that goes on. Um, you're transitioning into adulthood and you're trying to figure out who you are as a person. And I feel like for me, being at Southern University, being surrounded by um, a ton of Black women who you know, came from where I came from, have gone through the same programs that I've gone through and have gone on to be successful, was really inspiring, inspiring to me. And it never, never in once in my mind that I feel like as a black woman, I won't be able to achieve within this space because I've seen so many people who have done it. And if I'm trying to enter into a space where I haven't seen black women who've done it, I have black women around me who are cheering me on. So, I mean, I had mentors like Dr. Marshall and Dr. Snowden and Ms. Biatra who, have been there since, you know, some of them since I was in high school to constantly cheer me on into this space. So I think that has allowed me the confidence to know that whatever path I choose to take, whether it be in agriculture, whether it be in policy, or whether it be in something completely different, um, that I'm completely capable of it. And um, even to that point, I'm taking an economics class right now. And I was telling Dr. Marshall and Dr. Melian, like, if they see Dr. Yensei, please let her know that I thank her dearly, because the, the, the foundation that she gave me with Econ at Southern, when I say like, I am looking at my notes from, you know, sophomore, junior year when I took her. And those are the things that were keeping me in my economics class in graduate school at this, you know, R1 institution at, with, with 60,000 students. Um, it, it's really helpful. And same with my stats class. The things that I learned in biometrics are, you know, copying and pasting right into the curriculum that I'm, that I'm taking now. So. Um, I don't think that I'd be where I am without Southern University, and I'm super grateful to have people that not only challenge you and push you, but are also there to nurture you and help you when things are when things are super difficult. Because I think a lot of times we're either we either feel like we're being coddled or we feel like we're being pushed too hard. And I love that through my undergraduate experience, I was able to get that balance to say like, hey, you're capable of more, so keep pushing for more. But it's okay if it's super hard because you have an entire community here of people. Um, who are willing to help you, not only while you're in school, but, you know, 5, 10, 20 years after you leave. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. And now we're going to move back to Ms. Wilson. So, Ms. Wilson, what if everyone in the world, your chosen field, workplace, was exactly the same? 
if they all look the same, talk the same, shared the same views, practices and traditions, what kind of environment would it be? Do you think this would be a place or career that you want to dwell in? Why or why not? You know, Dr. Melian, I would start with saying um, something as simple as what Dr. Phil said, our diversity is our strength. And so the scientist, the biologist in me knows that the healthiest for us requires some diversity to maintain that health. And the same goes with regard to our communities. The healthiest, happiest uh, communities we, we see and, and most sustainable communities uh, you will see those diverse attributes within those communities. And so although the question uh, definitely feels like um, a, a, a storybook, um, <laughs> the, the reality is uh, we are a, a, such a diverse uh, nation and it's an opportunity for us to uh, really spend more time embracing the diversity that's around us. Um, I, I think that as we think about agricultural careers, I, I want to also think to uh, towards what Dr. Brown shared and, and the perception of agriculture. And I know what my perception was almost 20 years ago. And there isn't a whole lot of change, but we what we can do is provide that diverse representation and stay in the forefront in front of the next generation so they see that we are here and they see that they can be us. Um, I am extremely proud to be on this platform with Ms. Lewis because I have watched her uh, through her days at Southern University. And I, you know, so I think about how we are, uh, do we, do what I want to be part of, one voice, one color, one, you know, just a singular, I, I don't, I don't think so because what I know is diversity and and although there are some parts of the spectrum with regard to diversity who who might have a harder time than others do i think that is also it, it leaves an opportunity for that dominant culture to uh to to find out ways to mend those fences and um to be more inclusive so uh thank you for the question but i think i probably went a little off path with how i answered it but i, I really want to amplify and embrace diversity and, and really uh get away from that that thought process that we could be just we sh or we should just be one all the same thank you miss wilson um we will now go to uh dr fields dr fields um what is diversity and inclusion at a pwi what is it wow that's a big question um you know, every every PWI is very different. I'll say so. It's it's, it's difficult to put that into um, just one answer. I'll say that you know all uh, the institutions that I'm aware of have someone designated to work on issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now it functions a whole lot better at some universities than others. Uh, and in best cases, you know, universities are intentional in their efforts. Uh, they embrace all cultures and all people from back from all backgrounds and people participate from all backgrounds uh, and they learn from one another. But to do that, I think the university has to constantly listen to the overall campus community. Uh, the biggest mistake that I think we run into at PWIs uh, is thinking we know what someone else wants without uh, actually getting their input. Um, when the university is serious about uh, and intentional about DNI, um, they invest in it and they continuously celebrate. Um, and like I said, it, it's not always that way at every university. Uh, but now more than, than ever, I think PWIs are making uh, DEI a larger priority. And we know the, the things happening in our nation uh, have fueled a lot of that. Uh, everyone knows what happened uh, with enrollment at the University of Missouri a few years back when diversity issues weren't properly handled. Uh, no university president in the country um, or chancellor wants to deal with um, with that and, and deal with those type issues. So, you know, I, I think that um, we are we address it. You know, I, I can think of it while at Auburn University. You know, I noticed that our graduate students were in silos and that they didn't, you know, work well together. So we started something different. We did a um, multicultural potluck where students got together and they uh, from all backgrounds they wore their traditional attire, brought a dish that they had a recipe for, 
They talked about agriculture, the economy, tradition, celebrations, tourism in their area. And what we found was that students were much more alike than they were different. And, you know, they be, that began to change the overall culture of, of that campus. So uh, I think, though, it, we have to be at PWI, we have to be honest about our environment and be sensitive to what students of color experience. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, they see it as this is the best place in the world for anyone to be. But that's not the case always. You know, that the, the climate is far from perfect for every individual. So every university, every department is different, though. Um, there are faculty who have low expectations, who don't think you should be there. Um, it's probably better now than it once was, I would say. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, better doesn't mean that we've succeeded. You know, if we were 12 feet under and we got a eight foot release, if we relax and take a breath, we'll still drown. So we want to make sure that we, we know where we are and understand that we still have a lot of work to do. You know, I, I also did my doctorate at LSU and there, were definitely, um, there was definitely some cultural ignorance there. Uh, however, I would say that the majority of my experience was positive. And so I wouldn't be as general as to say that they don't want you there or that, you know, it's not a place where, you know, you could be successful. Um, but students have to feel like they belong. You have to have an environment where students feel like they belong. The environment will actually draw the students if DNI is, is embraced properly. And so if students are not participating, not coming to your events, you haven't developed the relationships well enough to uh, make them feel included and as, as a part of your organization. So uh, students, there's a two-way street though. You have to, you know, when those invitations are there, you have to be bold, it's uncomfortable for a little while. But, you know, I think here, when, when a student comes, no matter who it is, we're investing in them. So if we're in making that investment, our goal is for you to be successful. Um, and, you know, it, it's no one that wants to throw away money. So we, we want to make sure that we bring students here, give them the right environment, nurture, um, no matter who it is, nurture them to, to success. So. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fields. And now we will move to Dr. Brown. Um, so Dr. Brown, I would like you to answer this question uh, you can answer it from your current position or your previous position in corporate America. Do you mask or downplay any aspect of your physical, cultural, spiritual, or emotional self at work? The answer would be yes in both contexts. Uh, and to be brief about it, um, when I went into corporate, I realized that I needed to have a normal haircut I needed to have a normal suit, like black, uh, white shirt. Uh, I, I did all of those things, and I think it helped me to get in the door. Uh, but also my, my writing ability, uh, my, my speaking ability. If, you're, if your grammar is incorrect, you're going you're gonna to have some challenges. Uh, if your writing is not proficient, you're going to have some challenges. And so I try to be... And I hate to say it this way, but for the for clarity, I tried to be as white as possible to be accepted, knowing that they were hiring when I came out of school and they made it an issue to hire people of color. When I went in, there were only 10. When I went out, there were 80 some of us there, but now there are only two there because the, the culture really didn't want us there. You know, making six figures, they really, some people really don't want to see that. So I had to, I, I learned how, this is what I often, I use my white voice when I needed to. And, uh, and then I knew when I could be real. Uh, and so I, I, I did it then, and I, I still do it now even in ministry because there's a certain stigmatism that comes with what people think they want to see their pastor look like. Uh, so you, even within the black culture, we have our own issues and our own challenges. And so you, you have to, I don't think it's right, but I think we do it. And I call it coping mechanisms. Uh, there, there was something that I learned when I was with DuPont. There was a phrase we always talked about. Uh, they would always say, we want to be a melting pot. We want to be a melting pot. And at first, you know, that sounded good when I first went into the corporation. But then after a while, I started thinking about that's not a good term because what you're doing, you're utilizing heat to make everything homogeneous and that's not necessarily good. 
And so then I started saying that what we really needed to do was have a salad bowl approach. Because see, when you put a tomato in with the lettuce, the tomato is still the tomato and the lettuce is still the lettuce. And you, you lose diversity when you try to make a homogeneous mixture. And so you have to let people be the way they are. And so I'm, I'm glad to be able to see uh, our sisters wear their hair the way they want to now, but they couldn't have done that when I was in corporate or we couldn't wear hair on our faces, but you can now. So I did it uh, to get to where I am. And uh, I would tell anybody, you do what you need to do to take care of your family as long as it's legal. And then you deal with your personal issues as you grow and as you mature, because all of us have to go through phases where we figure out, wait a minute, this, there is a better way to do this. And sometimes power to the people will get you fired. Black Lives Matter get you fired. Thank you, Dr. Brown. <laughs> Um, this next question is coming from um, our chat. Um, is there a resource um, recommended to expose those who are uneducated about the diversity of careers in agriculture? And that's going to any of our panelists. I, I can take that, Ms. Lusk. Um, when it, when it comes to resource, I do think that manners, minorities in agriculture and natural resources related sciences is a good source if you are in college. If you are in grade school, for example, and considering agriculture or science, technology, engineering, mathematics related fields, I think that there's an opportunity for us to look close as close to home, similar to how I did. Uh, there are uh, the, Co the Southern University Agricultural Center is an excellent resource if you go to the website and uh, hopefully we can put it up or, or at least share it out in, in the chat. But one of the things I would say is it, it gives an opportunity for you to not only learn more about the field, but have a personal contact with uh, professionals, extension agents, and also students who are pursuing that education. And that's, uh, if you don't see in the chat, it's www.suaagcenter, S-U-A-G-C-E-N-T-E-R. Uh, I got my start in agriculture in 4-H. Uh, at a more local level. I'm from Oakdale, Louisiana, and I, I, I started 4-H in the fourth grade, and it carried me all the way through high school and as I transitioned into Southern University. So I think, I'm not sure what level the person is on with regard to who put the question in, but there are resources available, 4-H is one that may be happening right in their local parish, uh, or county if you're not in Louisiana and viewing, but if you are uh, uh, more considering in the age of college, high school, sophomore, junior, senior, there's the Southern University Agricultural Center is a great resource and, and, and consider some of those, you'll, you'll learn about some of the educational programs they offer as well, uh, whether they're during the school year or during the summer. Uh, so I'd like to offer that just in case they may not be in college and, and pursuing manners, but definitely uh, on a more grade school level. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Our next question uh, is going to go to our panelists. Any of you can answer from your favorite professor of plant and soil sciences, Dr. Yamani. As successful professionals and products of Southern University and Agriculture and Mechanical College, what advice do you have to our current students to be competitive and successful like you are? I can start. Um, get out of your comfort zone. There's no growth within your comfort zone. Um, so always take opportunities. I think that was one of the biggest things that I did in undergrad is um, if there was an opportunity for me to grow or stretch or practice different skills such as writing or public speaking, um, I took it. Especially leadership opportunities. If there's any um, leadership opportunities within organizations within the College of Ag or just within the university, um, make sure that you're getting involved because I think that that's one, the best way that you're gonna meet people, meet mentors, and to find out about those opportunities to um, grow and develop. I'll add on to that and I, I would echo everything that, that Ms. Lewis said. I, I really think that that 
getting out of your comfort zone is very important. Um, the other thing is do not take the path of least resistance. I think uh, a lot of times students are looking for how they can get out the fastest. And so they're not taking the, the more rigorous uh, course load, things like that. You know, go ahead and, you know, um, do, a little, do a little bit extra and, and really get yourself prepared and understand what, it, what it's going to take to be successful. Um, and uh, Ms. Lewis said this earlier also, have some confidence. I think that's one of the big things that, that shows through when, when you're meeting a student, you're going to know how confident they are in their abilities. And know that Southern University has prepared you and, and believe in yourself and, um, and, and go bold. Don't, don't, don't be apologetic about where you came from. Um, you probably were exposed to some of the greatest teachers in the country right there at Southern University. So um, take advantage of the opportunity, but do it, do it boldly. I would just simply say, stay green and grow. Stay green and grow. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we're going to move um, to our next question, and this is for all of our panelists. Um, so what advice would you give the leadership at the Southern University Ag Center on how to better prepare students for the world they will enter into post-graduation? Can any one of us take that first, Ms. Lusk? So one of the things I would say is exposure. Uh, I, I enjoyed and benefited from the amount of exposure I received when I was at Southern University. So whether it was attending a conference, uh, there were uh, keynote speakers, um, tutorials, demonstrations. Uh, Southern University has some dynamic alums, but not just alums, the network uh, across the larger and broader 1890 land grant HBCU family. I, I think the, the exposure is first and foremost one of those places where we want to continue to encourage the young people to take advantage um, because the reality is the, the, the nurturing you're receiving at Southern University is going to strengthen you and it's going to provide that, that, that foundation, but recognize that whether you're going off to graduate school or going, in, going straight into the office and to work, and for me, I chose federal government, you have to be ready and be prepared to be professional in those settings. And so having a glimpse uh, from the angle and the advantage of a student where you can retain some of the innocence uh, with regard to being in conferences or meetings, but getting a real keen eye of what the profession calls for, but then also the diversity of the professions that are available to you. So for me, even though forestry is the background I have, I'm not necessarily a practitioner or an arborist with regards to being in the field and climbing trees or pruning trees daily. I, my career has been about the business of conservation and how to engage communities and provide access and equity in programs to communities. And a lot of those communities are our HBC land grant university communities, bringing more young people into agricultural and conservation careers. So take advantage of any exposure in the programs, but Southern um, has been a fantastic partner of mine from U.S. Forest Service with regard to being agreeable to, to host some of the institutions and academies and, and workshops uh, where we can bring other professionals in. And so I would say just continue to be uh, open to those opportunities. Uh, and I think the young people, especially those who are ready to enter the career field and go on to higher education, will take advantage and, and they'll benefit from that. And I'll, I'll jump on and, and follow. Um, I would, you know, follow and, and, and co-sign on, on exposure, uh, which Ms. Wilson just said. You know, I, my Bayou program summer research experience at Cornell University was life-changing for me. Uh, it let me know that, you know, even at Cornell University, Ivy League, students were no more intelligent than I was. Um, they'd just been exposed to more. And so, you know, that, that was eye-opening to me, you know, to, to think, you know, that you can come from Southern, Winsboro, Louisiana, Southern University, and go on to uh, go anywhere and feel comfortable doing it. Um, another thing that I would, I would uh, advise, piece of advice I would give, um, I think Dr. Brown mentioned this earlier, work on the soft skills. 
uh, students need to know, they have to know how to communicate. They have to know how to communicate uh, in written communications. Uh, they have to know how to communicate verbally um, and just how to, how to be in any crowd and, and be comfortable. Um, and I would say also that um, you should try to identify talent early um, and, and make sure they're taking the necessary sciences and math that they need to be successful. Um, and also, you know, help them build that network of leaders across the nation whether it be Southern alums or whether it be um, just part of your network, introduce those top students uh, to individuals that you know, can help them build their career, help them as, as a mentor. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, was, I mentioned I was recently on a, on a webinar with, with, the, with National University leaders and one of them made the comment that they wondered if um, the issue was that the program was too rigorous for minority students to handle. And, I, I, and they, they, it was a question and, and I, someone answered, I had to go back and get them to repeat it because I couldn't believe that they felt that that was, that was the case. Um, so we still have some things to overcome. So when you get there, let them know what they have to face and the type of people that they may encounter that they probably will encounter. So you have to have them ready to understand that some people will have low expectations for their abilities and they have to overcome that and they have to work harder and work twice as hard for half the credit a lot of times. Um, I will say that the students that I've worked with that both Auburn and here, uh, who are students of color could compete anywhere in the world. Um, but you know, I, I say that, you know, just take advantage of the opportunity, make sure that they're exposed, make sure that they know what to expect and um, make sure that they never stop learning and make sure that they know that they can, not just learn what's in the books, but look at look at how they supplement that learning. You know, I, I've heard it said that he who prescribes you the diameter of your knowledge can determine the circumference of your action. So make sure that you get beyond what someone else gives you. I would add to that, keep the students first. Recruit, recruit, recruit. And then as, as faculty and staff keep an open door policy, because I could go whether it was the secretary or it was the instructor or it was the dean, I could get to anybody and communicate and learn or find out whatever it was I needed to find out. And as leadership, that is so important. And the last thing I would say, and I got this from Dr. Isaac Griggs, he would always say to us, you can't be as good as, you have to be better than. And you have to ingrain that in the minds of those students. You have to keep telling them because as others have already said, some of the greatest people have come out of the Ag Department at Southern University and we could all hold up against anybody at any Ivy League school. And we had nothing to hold our heads down for. I, I even remember when we went to soils competitions and we beat Texas A&M and Texas Tech and all of these other schools. But the reality is we had teachers that believed in us and they kept telling us, you can't just be mediocre. You got to be your best because you represent this institution. And if the faculty staff can't do that, then you can rest assured that the students won't have that confidence that they're going to need when they go into those rooms and go into those interviews. They got to be able to sell themselves. You got to look the part, but you also have to be the part. I think to kind of close out um, this question, I think all of this kind of goes back to relationships. And I think it's important that the university leadership continues to develop relationships with all types of students. I think a lot of times, especially through my experience, um, throughout my entire education, leadership tends to gravitate towards the, the top students, the top performing students. And a lot of times that, that leaves everyone else kind of just spending for themselves. Um, so I think it's important that Kind of like, I think um, Dr. Fields mentioned it, but identify all types of talents in students, not just those who are good in science, but figure out who, who's great at communicating, figure out who's really extroverted and loves connecting with people or loves speaking, um, but just really make sure that you are form forming and nurturing very genuine and authentic relationships with all students. Because once you can connect with the student on that level, then all of the other things that the panelists mentioned will come naturally. You'll be able to expose them to opportunities and they'll be willing to go where you tell them to go. They'll be able to take correction. They'll be able to take coaching and encouragement with ease um, 
when you start with building that authentic relationship. But if you start with a student and you're just telling them you need to do this and you need to go here and you need to try this and, you know, do this better and improve this skill, but you have no relationship with them, it's just going to go in one ear and out of another. So um, connect with each other as humans, connect with students as you would have wanted someone to connect with you when you were in their shoes. So now we will turn it over to Dr. McMeans. All right. Uh, first of all, good evening to everybody. Uh, this has indeed been a, an, an excellent uh, uh, webinar. Uh, as we conclude uh, this webinar from the Ag Center and the College of Ag, I want to thank a lot of people. Uh, but first, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Marshall, uh, Renita Marshall, and and Miss uh, Lisa Williamson, because I had this idea of doing something different uh, a few months back. And I just want to thank them for making it come through fruition uh, because uh, the fact that there are students out here asking relevant questions and there are other individuals asking questions that we will uh, again answer later, I, I think it has already served this purpose. Uh, but let me first uh, uh, thank our esteemed um, Southern University and College of Agriculture alumni who, who served as panelists, uh, Ms. Beatrice Wilson, uh, Ms. Irene Lewis, uh, Dr. Renee Brown, and, and Dr. D.Q. Fields. So when, when I was asking and, and discussing about who we should start with, I, I knew just my in, brief interactions. I, today is actually my one year anniversary at, at Southern, by the way. Um, and and I just thought about these these individuals because of personal interactions, my affiliation with Manners, um, supporters of the uh, of the urban forestry program, uh, national leaders. Uh, so I I personally, but but as Dr. Fields reminded me, he sent me a list, and I know Dr. Brown probably alluded to there. We have some we have great alumni of the Ag College. I mean, we have some great alumni, so I now have a list, and so we definitely will will continue on in this type of uh, endeavor. And I also want to thank them for taking time out of their busy schedules, you know, start you know starting a, a, a graduate program and and being an up administrator in federal agency and a dean at a at a, a PWI and a minister that I know who has to lead to. To, to, to go and, and, and make sure a worship service starts in time. So uh, I just appreciate all of you and your efforts and to take time out of this because I know how busy each of you are. Uh, second, I want to thank the participants uh, uh, for, for, first of all, for your time and attention, but also for asking good, relevant, and thought-provoking questions. If, if we did not get a chance to answer your question, like I just saw one as it relates to the hoop house, we will address that questioning and, and, and forward your uh, information to, to the appropriate individual. Uh, Chris, if you can, uh, please put uh, uh, my email uh, uh, information uh, uh, in the chat box. Uh, also, I would like to thank those individuals who put together this webinar, which I know will not be our last. Uh, uh, Doctors um, uh, Marshall, Emelion, uh, Lisa, uh, Chris, Lakeisha, thank you for the job you've done, uh, Sanjay, Dexter, and DeAndre. I, I really appreciate uh, all of your, your efforts in making this come to fruition. Uh, our purpose for this webinar uh, initially was, and, and, and uh, the title, uh, Dr. Marshall uh, helped to coin it, Solutions for Diversity, Access, and Equality, uh, was to bring out discussions related to not only agriculture and societal issues, but those challenges facing HBCUs today, which are numerous. Also the challenges facing people of color and what needs to happen to bring about change and, and how can uh, Southern University, more specifically the Southern University Ag Center and College of Ag be a catalyst to bring about this change. Uh, it is clearly understood that one and a half hours is not enough or sufficient time to to, to uh, have discussions on these uh, important matters, at least not in a comprehensive manner. Uh, to that fact, um, uh, we know that this is not the uh, last uh, webinar we will hold. We will definitely piggyback off of these. 
Uh, I will tell you that um, this webinar has enlightened me. I took notes. Uh, 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 thank you, Ms. Lewis. I think one of your points uh, was very well made about uh, making sure that we support all of our students, uh, the top students and those students who have talents that may not uh, be obvious uh, initially, but to make sure that we want all of our students to get across that finish line. And so I thank you. So I, I wrote down a lot of notes and I know Lisa did too. Uh, 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 and so I will um, definitely make sure that that we continue to, to have such uh, uh, webinars so we can have that information. And I also want to thank Drs. Uh, Brown and and fields they took me back to the university of illinois and uh the challenges i had uh when i started there as the only african-american working on a phd in plant and soil sciences uh it brought back some stories and i will have to tell you they weren't they weren't the fundest of stories and and um and and so we all especially in the panelists stated this we all are unique uh we we all are going into areas where we're not uh, at least uh, our ethnic background and 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 the color of our skin, we're not the prominent number of individuals representing our prospective programs or our fields. So we we have those challenges, as Dr. Fields said earlier. Uh, I only know of him and another a uh, dean, uh, African American dean at a PWI, and and that and 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 if you think about dean of agriculture, you think about that. Uh, we we definitely have a, a ways uh, ways to go. So um, I've learned a lot. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences, panelists, and your struggles and your and your advice. Uh, uh, in in my opinion, all of us have a story to to share. So we'll be reaching out to other alumni uh, that will definitely uh, be able to contribute um, to these discussions. So once again, thank you all for uh, your participation in this webinar. And, and, and make sure you continue to take care during these challenging times of racial unrest, uh, impacts of COVID-19, effects of recent hurricanes, and also our economic challenges. So now with that, I will say, just have a wonderful rest of your evening. And now I will turn it back over to Dr. Marshall to close us out. Dr. Marshall. Okay, Ms. Lusk, I think she has one announcement before I give the final one. Yes. Um, actually two announcements. The questions that we were unable to um, get to during this webinar, we will um, send out an email to everyone who registered with some answers um, by the end of this week. Continue to check your email. It will probably come from communications at suagcenter.com. And also, if you have any additional questions um, after we end tonight, please feel free to email those uh, questions to communications at suagcenter.com. I did put that email address in the chat um, for you. Also, if you have not completed your 2020 census, please do so uh, by September 30th. And if you have not registered to vote for the upcoming presidential election, we're encouraging you to register to vote and exercise your right. Thank you, Ms. Lusk. You actually handled one of my announcements. Thank you so much. This video, this webinar was recorded and it will be posted to the SU Ag Center's website for future viewing. And thank you all again and have a great evening. Bye-bye.